Can you raise a little the lights? It's as high as it goes. It's as high as it but goes. It's very dark. I can't see anything. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm going to have to. Oh, oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. I forgot I had my glasses. Okay, well, that was the talk. That's meditation. You want to know what meditation is? Is that. We spend our life walking around thinking we see the world as it is and we don't realize that we're always seeing through a filter. We're seeing through a mental model, through an interpretative filter that colors our experience. But like glasses, we don't see our filters, we see through them. And they become invisible, they become transparent. But they're not transparent, they have a color. They darken our life. We, we miss the brightness of the reality that surrounds us because we don't notice that we are seeing it through a dark glass darkly. One of the markers of human development is turning what used to be subject into object. And this is what that means. What used to be a part of the subject which is a filter that I use to interpret reality becomes an object in my awareness and I can see not through it but I can see it as a it as separate from me and that's the beginning of choice in life because now I can if I go out and it's too bright I can choose to put it on but when I walk in I can choose to take it off but choice is a function of the separation of subject and object. I have to be able to extricate myself from the filter to be able to decide when and how to use it. Well, most of us never get there because <laughs> taking your glasses, it's a lot easier off. It's a lot easier taking your eyes off. And the kind of filters that I'm talking about are more like eyes than glasses. So for example, these glasses are red. I spent a big part of my life being angry with people. And I thought that they were making me angry. So the anger was not mine, it was induced by them. And we, we speak like that, you're making me angry, you're making me sad, you're making me scared, or you're making me happy. I love you, you make me so happy. My daughter once said, Daddy, I really love you as much as the TV. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're three, that's very cute. When you're 33, that's really dangerous. I mean, you could say that to cocaine, you know, you make me really happy. But if you look, listen to the love songs, it's all about that. It's how the loved object makes me happy. So... It was a long path for me to realize that people don't make me angry, people don't make me happy, people don't make me loving, Not, nothing makes me anything. But the me that I want to discover is the me that has a choice in the face of whatever happens. So it could be that anger is an appropriate response to something that happens, but it's not a response elicited by what happens. It's a choice on how to respond appropriately. And the choice is a function, as I said, of this separation. So I am not seeing the world darkly. I am seeing the world as bright as any human being can possibly see it. So if you want to debug your mental model, if you want to scrub these dark glasses that we have, how do you do it? I mean, I tried everything. I mean, some of the things I will tell you, some other things I would go to jail if I confessed. But I, 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 I mean, I tried everything. And you know, there are a lot of exciting things that uh, seem to do the trick for a while, but nothing really lasts. Uh, there's no, I, I haven't found any lasting way to turn the dial from a world of victimhood where I think reality is driving me to a world of balance and openness and consciousness where I find myself in a flow, except for meditation. 
that was the only thing that I found could could do the trick, so to speak, could help me. And I meditated for many years. Um, as Master Charles would say, I did it the low-tech way. And um, it was hard. It was hard, painful. I mean, my back hurt. I mean, sitting cross-legged on the floor. I'm, I'm, I'm very inflexible. I, I, I just, it's just hard. Uh, and it, it didn't fully satisfy me. I felt peaceful, but it wasn't, it wasn't doing the the profound work I wanted. I, I didn't find meditation beyond relaxation and beyond a certain state of peace. It wasn't fully delivering my goals. I, I wasn't getting to this profound transformation of separation between me as a conscious, aware subject and objects, all the way back to the ultimate subjectivity, which is insubstantial. So, I mean, when you peel, it's like an onion. You peel, you peel, who am I? Who am I? Who am I really? Well, I'm an Argentinian. Okay, but could I have been born in another country and still be me? Well, yes, of course. I, I mean, in fact, I moved out of Argentina. So I could be me without being Argentinian. So Argentinian is not a feature of myself. Argentinian is just an attribute, but it's an insubstantial attribute. OK, so I'm not Argentinian. What am I? Um, you know, I'm a soccer fan of uh, a particular club. Uh, no, no, I could have been a soccer fan of another club. Um, I'm a man. And then I started thinking, could I have been born a woman and still be me? And I mean, logically, yes, I could think of that. So what is the me that is left when all the filters and all these other layers are removed? I wanted to, I wanted to f feel that. I, I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to experience it. And meditation wasn't, wasn't quite doing it for me. And then unbeknownst to me, I found the technology that Master Charles developed about 15 years ago. He had a different, I mean, his, his, his name was Brother Charles, so it took me a while to realize it was the same Charles. And I started using this, and it, it really made a huge difference. The, the soundtracks, and I thought, well, you know, if nothing else, it's giving me the discipline to stay an hour, because it lasts an hour, so I'd, I'll sit for an hour and I'll meditate for an hour. But it wasn't, it wasn't just the discipline. Something was happening, and I've been using this technology for about 15 years. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I'm screwed up. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting myself as an example. You know, in spite of what you see in me, the technology actually works. Uh, so you can, hopefully, Master Charles will speak, and then you can see what the technology can do for a real enlightened being. <laughs> um, but uh, but it, it, has, it has made a tremendous difference. And all the, all the material I teach, and many of the things I do with you in LinkedIn are, I would say, a trap and a trick to get people to meditate. Why? How does it work? So I, I, I work with some of you, and you'll, it's always the same. We have a conversation or in a workshop, and there's a problem. And shockingly, the business problem has a surprisingly simple solution, which is having a conversation or engaging with people openly. And once we do it, it's like, of, of course. <laughs> it's so obvious that this is the way to solve the problem. Like, uh, you know, if, if one of your people is not performing and you have to have a, a hard conversation, there's so much fear in engaging. And then I ask, so if you were not afraid, what would you say to this person? And I tell you, 99% of the time, what people tell me is so beautiful and so open and so clean. They say, why don't you just say that? And we go like, yeah, I could say that. Will you say it? Yeah, I'll say it. OK, try it. And I meet again two weeks later. Did you try it? No, I couldn't. Well, what do you mean you couldn't? Well, I just didn't feel the moment was right. I said, but you said you were going to do Well, I don't know. Something just didn't click. Or I tried, and it was a disaster. But did you say what we talked about? What well, kind of? Well, what do you mean kind of? Well, I changed it a little bit because I didn't want to be so tough. The tools are so simple that it's shocking to people that they can't use them. But here's the secret. It is not about the tool. It is always the tool user. The tool is never the problem. It's always the tool user. So the more I have learned about 
conscious business or the more I've developed this methodology, the more I've convinced myself that it's trivial. I mean, everything I wrote in the book is totally trivial. There's, I learned it from other people. There's no, there's no secret. What's almost impossible is to be the tool user capable of using the tools. And that's why at the end of the path, what, what you come back to is who am I? And how can I be the kind of person that can really use this material, that can really engage with this level of honesty, integrity, truth, openness? And that you don't get from the tools, that you get through personal development. And that's why I'm, I feel incredibly excited about introducing Master Charles and having him speak about himself and his path. His, um, really amazing man and the technology he's developed and hopefully you will get some of that energy and we'll also do a practice and my dream I'll confess it after this is that some of you will be interested and we can start a meditation group at LinkedIn and um, you know host it just just meet regularly and just meditate and talk about what we're learning and so on it'd be one of my big dreams about coming to LinkedIn to help people work on themselves at this level of depth so without further ado, I'll introduce Master Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, for that very beautiful introduction and I want to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you in the awareness of our oneness you me all and everything is the same blissful consciousness there is only one and it is in this holistic awareness in this very moment that you are welcomed. Now what did I just say? What does that mean? Let's see if we can make it really simple. We all share life. It empowers us equally. And life is conscious energy. And the conscious energy that is life is often termed consciousness. And there is only one consciousness just as there is only one life. So again, in life, in consciousness, we are all one and equal. And the conscious energy that is consciousness, if we really look into it, if we use a high-powered enough microscope and focus it on our own hand and see to the subatomic level of our experience, the conscious energy is a self-delighting energy. The very essence of what we are as life forms, the essence of all and everything, if you have the eyes to see it, is but a self-delighting, joyous energy. And thus it is often given the term bliss. It is a blissful energy. Life in essence is blissful consciousness. So you, me, all and everything are one in the blissful consciousness of life that is our essence. And it's in this holistic awareness that you are welcomed in this moment. First and foremost, let's endeavor to be as wakeful as we could possibly be in this very moment. Wakefulness is proportional to balance in the relative field that governs all experience. And one of the easiest gateways to balance so that we might be wakeful of the blissful consciousness that is our essence is our very breath. Breath is life. Life is consciousness. Breath 
and life are only ever experienced in the here and now of their happening. You don't breathe yesterday, you don't live tomorrow. We live and breathe, we are consciousness here and now. And if we can just open our awareness and observe ourselves breathing, we're more present, we're more wakeful, we're more balanced in the here and now of true reality as one blissful consciousness. So this is your responsibility in this presentation to maintain the observation of your breathing as we continue. Simple. Very good. Our subject for today is modern spirituality in the digital age, harnessing technology for the evolution of consciousness. And I'd like to preface it with a, a quotation from uh, Socrates. Socrates was a very wise man <clears throat> because he knew that knowledge was bondage. Socrates was a master of the primary computer, the brain-mind computer. <clears throat> he was able to create what I call the clear mind experience, a mind not identified with its content. We could say Socrates was a believer in not believing. He was able to live in a state of witnessing consciousness <clears throat> wherein he could be a master of his own brain-mind computer. And this is important because if you don't master the primary computer, your own brain-mind, <laughs> you have no mastery of other technologies that you encounter in life. But just as you know from working with technology and working with the computer on your desk, <clears throat> if you don't understand it, and if you don't master it, it can cause you a lot of misery and suffering. And so it is with this primary computer, the brain-mind computer. If we don't understand it, if we don't know the mechanics of how it works and all of its systems, then it can cause us a lot of misery and suffering. So primarily as human beings, we need to focus on ourselves. We need to bring to mastery the human brain, mind, computer, because through it, we can either deliver ourselves to balance, wholeness, and fulfillment in our life experience, or we can bring ourselves to fragmentation, conflict, and resultant suffering. And the choice is always ours. So again, Socrates was a very wise man in terms of his mastery of the brain-mind computer. And his quote is, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Hmm, interesting quote, no? Beware the barrenness of a busy life. We live in the digital age, the information age. The speed of information processing is fast and furious. Just to keep pace every day, you have to stay plugged in 24-7. And if you have not mastered your primary computer, the brain-mind computer, and you stay plugged in 24-7, you can very easily become fragmented, imbalanced, and stressed to the point of burnout. And all uh, corporate coaches and corporate executives, as well as the medical community and related pundits, recognize this. It is a challenge in the digital age, burnout. And so what do they recommend as a remedy? They tell us, hmm, that we must periodically 
unplug in order to restore our balance and maintain our wholeness and our fulfilling experience of life. <clears throat> and that's all well and good. However, the construct that they offer us is a construct of meditation that is thousands and thousands of years old and therefore doesn't really suit us because it is not relevant to the times in which we live. So I question whether such recommendations of ancient contexts of meditation are really beneficial to our experience because what happens when you use them. If you employ a classical construct of meditation, the first thing you have to understand is it takes a lot of time to actualize measurable results. And I'm talking about hours a day, every day, for the rest of your life. Consider the times in which it emerged. Go back eight to 10,000 years in human experience. People had a lot more time available to them than we have today. They had time to sit in caves, cross-legged, for hours a day meditating and experienced actionable results. My question for you today or for anyone is, how many people do you know who own a cave? And if they do own a cave, <laughs> do they have the time to spend several hours in it day after day after day to actualize beneficial result? And of course the answer is no. And this is what happens uh, when pundits today recommend these forms of meditation to a world that doesn't have the one necessary requirement, which is time. Mm -hmm. We are time challenged. So you will try it. You won't put in the requisite time because you're not really informed about how much time it takes. It doesn't work that well. And eventually, what do you do? You drop the practice, or you don't do it enough to get really measurable results. So the question really is, <clears throat> is it necessary to unplug in a classical construct of meditation or meditation-related focusing techniques like uh, mindfulness or, or wakefulness? Uh, in the times in which we live? And my answer to that is no. Don't unplug. Now that seemingly puts me at odds <laughs> with most <laughs> uh, corporate and medical pundits. But based on my experience, I'm saying don't unplug, rather stay plugged in but learn to harness technology to create the balance that supports wakefulness and wholeness and fulfillment in your experience while you are engaged with technology. We must make the meditative construct of balance, wholeness, and fulfillment relevant to the times in which we are living. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, <clears throat> technology in relation to meditative construct or the principles of balance, wholeness, and fulfillment. And how we, as human forms, biology, can interact more efficiently and precisely with technology. <clears throat> And let's begin with um, a look at uh, biology and technology as forms 
of consciousness. We don't often think in these ways. Uh, we don't often go back to uh, the essence, the source that we all share, again, which is that fundamental consciousness. Consciousness is orchestrating the show. Well, consciousness creates the life form called human being. It also creates the form or the instrument called technology. And why does it create all these instruments? It creates all these instruments so that it can fulfill its primary intention, which is ever to ever more fully be itself, which it's been doing now for almost 15 billion years since the Big Bang. <clears throat> all forms, all instruments are instruments of consciousness through which it experiences itself, processes the information of the experience, and grows resultant developmental self-awareness. And the measure of evolution then in individuated consciousness is self-awareness. Why are human beings regarded as the superior species on this planet? Because we exhibit the most self-awareness. But there's a challenge on the horizon. And what is the challenge? The challenge is technology. Is technology surpassing biology in terms of self-awareness? Is the computer or the smartphone in your pocket going to outpace you in developmental evolutionary self-awareness? And the projection, conservatively speaking, is within 50 years. AI becomes self-aware and actualizes singularity. <clears throat> Singularity, I'm using that term in uh, an understanding of it more archetypally as total holistic self-awareness. The awareness, the full awareness of consciousness in all of its forms as itself in the eternal now of its happening. <clears throat> so is, again, technology going to outpace biology <clears throat> and if it is, and it seems to be moving in that direction, then we as human beings need all the help we can get. We are biology, and if we don't keep pace with technology, if we don't befriend technology, if we don't merge with technology to create human 2.0, self-aware, truthful experience of reality in the context of singularity, then we, like the dinosaurs, will be made redundant. So again, we must do as all great masters have invited us to do for thousands of years. We must invest in self-awareness. <clears throat> so again, how do we do that in a way that is relevant to the times in which we live. Do we use 10,000 year old constructs of meditation that take a lot of time that we don't have <clears throat> to produce measurable results in terms of developmental self-awareness? Or do we befriend technology and harness it to the evolution of our consciousness and the actualization of evolutionary self-awareness. That's the challenge today. <clears throat> Let's look now at meditative construct for a moment and see if we can understand the old and then in relation to the new. Where we've been and where we're going. And after I explain it, <clears throat> and we can understand it, then what I'd like to do is move into the technological aspects of it and we'll share an experience of it. So you can experience the application of technology that I'm talking about. Meditative construct is really easy to understand in a classical context. <clears throat> the classical context of meditation posits a relative reality. It says, we live in a relative reality with its two polarities and all experience is relative. And meditative construct uses the two polarities, as Fred mentioned, of 
subjective and objective. And it says that the two polarities must be balanced if we are to experience holistic self-awareness or the experience of the oneness of all and everything as blissful consciousness, a truthful perception of reality. 